and uh, he's Roy Remez from Tel Aviv University, and he's going to talk about super narrow frequency conversion. Thank you. Okay, so um, let me start by thanking the um, committee, the Fedo family, uh, for this for this prize. Um, my name is Roy. I'm a PhD student under supervision of Professor Arie, and um, I'm here to tell you a bit about our research. It's called Super Narrow Frequency Conversion, and it combines two main research fields. The first one is nonlinear optics, and the second is called super oscillating functions. Um, so this is a picture of a very um, famous guy, and he looks at super oscillations, and he's a bit, I don't know, um, grumpy, or maybe offended, and uh, he has a reason to be, and we'll see why in a few slides. And I'll try to convince you how super oscillation functions can be used to overcome something that seems to be a fundamental limitation in uh, filtering optical signals using nonlinear optics processes. So, <coughs> as an introduction, <coughs> sorry, let's uh, consider a simple uh, process in nonlinear optics. Um, you have laser in one wavelength with amplitude A1, um, and after it goes through the nonlinear uh, crystal, you get another a second wavelength. In the case of second harmonic generation, you start with wavelength lambda, and you get half lambda at the output. So, given the A1 amplitude, we can ask ourselves what is A2. So, A, A2 has an expression um, uh, that looks like Fourier transform, of a function, function D, and D is called the modulation function. Basically, for very simple uh, crystals, um, D equals one inside the crystal and zero outside. And if I take the Fourier transform of this function, what I get is a very familiar sync response. Um, and this is the amplitude of the output wavelength uh, as a function of delta K. So delta K is called the phase mismatch and it's a, a quantity that uh, uh, holds within the uh, refractive index of the material and the wavelength of the um, uh, input or output uh, laser. And this is the amplitude if I want to talk about efficiency of the process or the intensity, I need to square this, and what I get is sync square response. One of the big problems in nonlinear optics is that our working point is usually uh, not where delta k equals zero, and therefore you have low efficiency. So one solution to this problem is modulating the nonlinear crystal. We are changing the sign of the nonlinear coefficient, and what we get is um, this form of a, a periodic function with a period lambda, and what it does after I calculate Fourier transform it cheaply, we get the exact same sync response, only shifted by amount of 2 pi over lambda. And this way, I also, in the efficiency, get a high value for our working point. Okay, so in the previous slide, I showed you how Fourier transform can help us um, achieve high efficiency at our working point. But then again, it also brings a certain limitation. And um, <clears throat> the limitation comes from the fact that since the crystal is limited in size, um, actually both A2 and the efficiency are band limited functions. Um, this means that if, I ask, if we ask ourselves, what is the highest oscillation we expect to find in this plot? It comes from the very edges of the crystal. So if I look at two delta functions at the edges of the, uh, of the crystal, and I see how uh, they appear after uh, uh, the transform, um, we see this frequency. And after square, squaring it, we get the same frequency uh, at the efficiency plot. So this is the highest frequency we, we expect to see here in this efficient, efficiency plot. And the same goes for the periodically pulled crystal uh, uh, because it's simply the same response only shifted. So why would oscillations in the efficiency plot interest us at all? 
Uh, well, um, the thing is we can use these kind of crystals in order to filter out unwanted frequencies. For example, assuming you have an input uh, um, signal of two peaks, two channels of different wavelengths, and after they undergo the nonlinear process, what we actually have is three peaks at the output. So let's assume for a second we want to filter out these two extra peaks. And to make this challenging, let's assume that they are very close to one another. So what we can do, we can place the two unwanted frequencies at the zero nodes, which are close to the first side lobe of the sink. This way, since these two have zero efficiency, um, they will be automatically filtered out and we'll, we will be remained only with the central wavelength. So this is for the periodically polled crystal, but we can ask a more general question. And this question can be, how close can these two unwanted frequencies be, um, but generally? Well, since this is the highest oscillation we expect to find in the efficiency plot, then we can answer this question to be 2 pi over L. Again, the highest frequency um, in the Fourier spectrum. Okay. Um, what if we want to filter out to even closer frequencies? We can use larger crystals. But larger crystals are harder to fabricate and sometimes even impossible. And we can also add filters, but this is a non-compact solution and we are looking for something which is a bit more compact. So what we actually want is we want a function which oscillates very fast, but that it would be the result of a Fourier transform of a function that is non-zero only at the crystal area. This means we want function that oscillates faster than the highest Fourier component. And it turns out, um, some would find this surprising, that these, function, these functions actually exist. There are functions that oscillate faster than the, than the highest Fourier component. And in 1994, Berry made the following claim. He said, we can take Beethoven Ninth Symphony, it is one hour and five minutes, and you can decode it in one hertz, band-limited function. And just to make sure uh, you understand what I mean by this, let's take one hertz frequency, add to it slower than one hertz frequency, add to it a frequency even slower than this, and add many other frequencies. All of them are slower than one hertz, and what we get in the end is a very dense function that can be Beethoven Ninth Symphony. Okay, and if we take the Fourier transform of this, what we get is a band-limited function with one hertz as the highest frequency component. Okay, enough with that. Um, so, <clears throat> I actually spent uh, listening to the whole one hour and five minutes just to pick the right part for an after lunch lecture. So, okay. Um, of course, there is a catch, right? Because this is very uh, unintuitive and, and, and you can immediately ask, where did the frequencies go? So, um, so the catch is this. If we look at the values before Beethoven Ninth Symphony and after it, you get very high values in this function. And by very high, Berry actually calculated this and he got to the number of e to the power of 10 to the power of 19. So this is a very, very large number and practically impossible to realize in the lab. But more modest super oscillation functions were used before, um, and they were used to create high contrast microscopy, subdiffraction optical spots, both at the group of uh, uh, Nikolai Zeludev. And here in Tel Aviv University, a group of Valon Babad did super transmittance through absorbing media. 
Okay, um, so to give you an example of super oscillating functions, um, we uh, try to think about the simplest function that we can find, which is super oscillating. And we can construct it quite easily. Take cosine x and decrease it by a constant factor s. And s can be anywhere between zero and one. And this function intersects the zero line in two points, these two points. And these two points can be arbitrarily close to one another, right? I just need to increase s by a little bit, and these two points come, come closer. Of course, this is not, not super oscillation, but if we square this function, what we get is only positive values, and these two points, zero points, remain zero. So if I zoom in on this part, what I get, look at the uh, red line here, what we get is a very small oscillation, and this oscillation can be as small as, as we want, simply by increasing s by a little bit. Okay, but what about the Fourier transform of this function? Well, we can simply open the parentheses here of this red function, use simple trigonometric identities, and we get that the highest frequency is uh, omega. And if I draw this highest frequency here in this plot, I guess this frequency, which is evidently much wider than the uh, small oscillation. And again, omega and s are two different degrees of freedom. I can change s, the, uh, make the super oscillation even faster, but um, uh, uh, omega would remain constant. So this is a very simple uh, um, example for a super oscillating function. And we took this function and we designed the crystal uh, for which the efficiency has this response. <laughs> this is a super oscillation in the efficiency of the crystal. So in order to do that, what we had to do is to decode this function to the crystal. And we did this using um, a method developed in our group by Roy Shiloh and found the necessary function. And this is how the crystal looks like. So if this is the function that describes the crystal, if I take the Fourier transform of this and square the function, what I get is efficiency response with a super oscillation. And again, if I compare it to the highest oscillation I expected according to the transform, um, I get something which is much wider. So we have implemented this uh, in the lab. Um, and uh, you can see uh, the sync response for a normal crystal. This is in blue. And the side lobes, which also um, has the width of the uh, period of the highest oscillation we expect to find. And uh, our super oscillating function uh, is here, uh, about 40% narrower than the sink side lobe. This means we can filter out two frequencies using this crystal, which are 40% closer to one another. Um, so uh, this is our experimental result. And this is relatively pre pre preliminary because what we can do is uh, we can use higher order super oscillations um, and basically achieve whatever response that we like. Of course, the penalty would be on the amplitude. Like in the case of Beethoven Ninth Symphony, um, also here we get, um, as, as we uh, add more super oscillations to the uh, function, um, the intensity also decreases uh, quite significantly. Okay, so to summarize, um, I showed you a nonlinear converter with a super oscillating response, and it was about 40% narrower than the first side lobe of the sink. Um, and with this, I want to thank again the committee and the Feather family for the prize, and you for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you.